Hey guys. Hey Bo. Uh, hi Bo. Ladies and gentle people, the bell has rung, therefore class has begun, therefore you should be sitting in your seat ready and excited to do an introductory uniformly accelerated motion or UAM problem. Absolutely. Yes. Oh boy. All right, let's get right to the example problem. We're going to actually take a more detailed look at one of the examples from last time, the bike braking example. So, uh, Bo, could you please read the problem? Sure. Mr. P is riding his bike at 22.9 kilometers per hour when he applies the brakes, causing the bike to slow down with a constant acceleration. After 1.01 seconds, he has traveled 4.00 meters. Part A, what was his acceleration? And part B, what was his final speed? It's time to translate that problem to physics. Bo, could you please uh, read the problem again? And Bobby, could you please translate? Mr. P is riding his bike at 22.9 kilometers per hour when he applies the brakes, causing the bike to slow down with a constant acceleration. Please stop. Velocity initially equals 22.9 kilometers per hour. And we know we can use the UAM equations because it says the acceleration is constant. Yes, very nice, Bobby. It is important that you are able to identify when you can use the uniformly accelerated motion equations. In other words, when the object is in uniformly accelerated motion. It does say in the problem that it is a constant acceleration, therefore we can use the UAM equations. Now I know it's in the title of the video, so certainly you can use it this time, but it is important that you're able to identify when you can use the UAM equations. And please, don't tell me that I have three of the UAM variables, therefore it must be uniformly accelerated motion. That is not always true. After 1.1, .1, no. After 1.01 seconds, he has traveled 4.00 meters. Part A, what was his acceleration? And part B, what was his final speed? Okay, um, change in time is 1.01 .01 seconds. The displacement is the 4.00 meters. For part A, acceleration equals question mark, and part B, velocity final equals question mark. Hold up, I, I thought the question asked for the final speed, not the final velocity. That was very perspicacious, Billy. Thanks. You are welcome. When an object is moving in a straight line as it is in this problem, then the speed at a specific time or location and the velocity at that same time or location are going to have the same magnitude. So yes, we can use the UAM equations. We're just gonna get the magnitude of those variables. And again, that's because this, in this example, we're moving in a straight line. For example, we won't actually figure out the final velocity, we're gonna figure out the final speed, and we won't actually figure out the acceleration, we'll figure out the magnitude of the acceleration, the acceleration without a direction. Now, it probably should be more clear from the problem statement, but it is pretty typical of problems of this ilk that they pretty much ignore the direction. Um, and I wanted to model that in this problem because you are going to run into problems like that in your physics career. Oh, so then the 4.00 meters isn't actually the displacement, it's the distance traveled. However, because you moved in a straight line, they're both the same thing, right? Correct. It's the magnitude of the displacement that we have here, uh, four meters, not the displacement itself because it doesn't have a direction. You're correct there. Uh, Billy, how would you like to solve the problem? Well, uh, we have three UAM variables, so we just need to pick the correct UAM equation in order to find the other two UAM variables. Um, we know the initial velocity, the displacement, and the change in time and we're trying to find the acceleration. There's only, there should be only be one equation that has those four variables in it. It's um, the displacement equals velocity initial times the change in time plus one half times the acceleration times the change in time squared. Yes, this is the only UAM equation we can use in this case. Now, many of you are gonna feel compelled at this point to plug in numbers, and I would not. I would actually suggest that you first start by rearranging the equation to solve for the acceleration, please. Why? It's probably easier to plug in numbers at this point. Um, actually, I would consider which one's easier to be debatable, and we're not gonna have that, have that debate. It doesn't seem worth our while. Uh, my point is more that in the long run, we're gonna have to rearrange a lot of equations in physics, and it's best to get used to that right now so it's easier when we get farther into the class. Um, 
Bo, could you please rearrange this equation to solve for the acceleration? Well, we should start by subtracting velocity initial times change in time from both sides. That leaves us with change in position minus initial velocity times the change in time equals one half acceleration times change in time squared. Uh, then we can divide both sides by one half change in time squared, and we are left with moving the acceleration over to the left, with acceleration is equal to displacement minus velocity initial times change in time. Uh, that quantity divided by one half of the change in time squared. Very nice, Bo. You subtract the velocity initial times the change in time from both sides, and then you divide both sides by one half times the change in time squared. You end up with the acceleration equals the displacement minus the velocity initial times the change in time, that whole quantity divided by one half times the change in time squared. Now, it doesn't really matter on which side we have the variables. We know that they're both equal, so we can say this is acceleration equals the displacement minus the velocity initial times the change in time, that whole quantity divided by one half times the change in time squared. Bobby, what would you like to do next? Well, we have all the numbers, so let's just plug them in. Careful, dimensions are your... Friends. You need to make sure they play well together. We need to convert to meters and seconds before we plug them into the equation. Absolutely. Uh, the, the only thing not in meters and seconds is the initial velocity, so multiply the 22.9 kilometers per hour by one hour over 3,600 seconds to cancel out the hours and multiply by a thousand meters over one kilometer to cancel out the kilometers and we're left with, hold up, give me a second. Uh, 6.36 with a repeating one at the end meters per second. Yes, you need to make sure that your dimensions play well together. You should never put kilometers and hours on the same team as meters and seconds. It will just not go well. So now that we have all of our numbers, we can simply plug those in. And Bo, what do we get for an answer? Negative 4.75389, or with three sig figs, negative 4.75. Dimensions are your brag. Negative 4.75 meters per second squared. Great, so for an answer for part A, we get negative 4.75 meters per second squared. That's rounded to three sig figs because the least number of significant digits from our givens was three. Uh, Bobby, could you please work on part B? Uh, let's see. We could use the equation velocity final squared equals velocity initial squared plus uh, two times the acceleration times the change in position. Uh, we're, we're looking for the final velocity, so we just take the square root of the whole equation, and we get that the final velocity is equal to the square root of the initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration times the change of position. Uh, we know all the numbers, and they're all in meters per second, so they can play well together, so we can just plug in the numbers. So velocity final equals the square root of 6.36 with a repeating one, the 6.36 one squared, uh, plus two times the negative uh, 4.75 uh, times four, and we're gonna get uh, 1.56963, which rounds to 1.57 meters per second with three sig figs. Sadly, uh, we have the wrong answer. I, I use the rounded answer for part A. Yeah, that's right. Never use a rounded answer. Always the, use the unrounded answer with enough sig figs. Or your answer will be wrong. Is that actually true? Uh, yes, that's absolutely true. Let's take a look at what happens when we actually write in the correct numbers. Notice that when we use the unrounded answer for part A in part B, we end up with our final velocity equal to 1.55968, which rounds to 1.56 meters per second, which is clearly not 1.57 meters per second. Please always use the unrounded answer when you're working through a problem. Does it really matter? Uh, yes. Okay, it just seems pedantic to me. Uh, nice use of the word pedantic, and uh, however, yes, you absolutely makes a difference. In physics, you're either right or you're wrong, and this answer is wrong. Uh, I guess in physics, we all have to be pedants. 
Uh, oh, and speaking of pedantic, I do want to remind everybody that what we found here was the final speed, not actually the final velocity because we don't have a direction. Yeah, Bobby, what's your question? For part B, wouldn't it have been easier to use the equation velocity final equals velocity initial plus acceleration times the change in time instead? Actually, there are three different equations we could have used uh, when we got to this point. The reason for that is because we actually know four of the UAM variables. There are actually then three different equations we could use to solve for the final velocity. Let me walk through that real quick. So again, there are three different equations we could have used to solve for the final velocity because we knew four of the UAM variables at that point. Uh, which one is the easiest? Probably quite pedantic. Um, any more questions at this point? I, yes. If I convert 1.55968 meters per second to kilometers per hour, I get about 5.6 kilometers per hour. Why did the speedometer on your bike say 5.6 kilometers per hour? Wow, you guys are really paying attention. That's awesome. Uh, it turns out that the speedometer actually only takes data one time every turn of the wheel. So during the 1.01 seconds, the wheel only makes around roughly two and a half turns. Therefore, it doesn't take enough data to have registered enough change in the speed of the bike. Any more questions? No. Nope. No. But thanks for asking. In that case, I've enjoyed learning with you today. I hope you've enjoyed learning with me. Lecture notes are available at flippingphysics.com. Please enjoy lecture notes responsibly. <laughs> Uh, 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 uh.